Okay, we're good. Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we look forward to the future and change it. Today we got Don Hoffman on the program. Don's a professor at UC uh, Berkeley Irvine and has some really interesting perspectives on, well, perspectives. Thanks for coming today, Don. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Matt. So I heard a, I heard a great interview with you and Rob Reed on his podcast, and I wanted to dive into, into your work, really. What is your background and how did you become interested in consciousness and reality? So my background, my undergraduate degree was from UCLA in something called quantitative psychology, which is like mathematical psychology, major and a minor in some mathematics and computer science. And then for my PhD, I, I worked in the artificial intelligence laboratory at MIT and in what's now called the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department at, at MIT with uh, David Marr, who was a, a vision scientist. And so I, I started off really interested in understanding human vision and human cognitive processing more, more generally. I was always interested as well in the bigger questions about um, you know, what is consciousness? What are people? Are we machines? That's why I got into artificial intelligence. I was very interested in the question, are people machines or not? And I figured if I wanted to get at that question, I should probably jump into artificial intelligence and psychology and really understand how people tick and how machines tick and then see if I could find find out what the differences are or if they're just the same thing. And so that was sort of my interest. And I got into vision partly because it's just intrinsically interesting, but also because it's, it's a, a way to start to take on really concrete problems, try to solve really concrete problems. And that way I could really learn the field. But if you jump into consciousness uh, and the big questions um, too early, you're not really prepared. You don't have the tools to, to address it. So I decided to take some specific concrete problems in, in vision science and work on those for a few years so I could really you know get the feeling of the field. And you've developed some, let's just say, transformational theories on what reality is, what perception and consciousness is. Let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so what, shall I just talk a little bit about my thoughts on that? or? Yeah, I, I imagine your thoughts have evolved quite a bit since, right. since getting involved. That's right. So um, initially, um, like most of my colleagues in the cognitive neurosciences, I, I assumed that... Um, our senses evolved and were shaped by natural selection, and that our senses were shaped by natural selection to show us true properties of the world that were important for our survival. And, you know, of course, I didn't think, and none of my colleagues think that evolution has shaped us to see all of the truth, but I thought, and most of my colleagues do think, that evolution has shaped us to see those aspects of objective reality uh, that are critical for our species to to survive. And so, so I was involved then in in just mathematically modeling how is it that the visual system, in particular, um, recovers, as we put it, uh, reconstructs the true three dimensional shapes and colors and motions and other properties of, of physical objects. So, so the idea is that there's a real space-time out there that exists whether or not anybody perceives it. And there are real physical objects with real properties, position and shape and mass and momentum and so forth, independent of whether anybody is looking at them. And, and the goal of our uh, visual system is, and of our sensory systems more, more generally is to recover true properties of this pre-existing physical world. And so I spent many years working on mathematical models about how we could actually recover three-dimensional shapes of objects from the, the motions that we see that are only two-dimensional motions you know, projected onto our, the retinas of our eyes and, and other things like that. I, I studied a little bit about object perception as well. How do we recognize objects? Um, bring both an artificial intelligence perspective and um, an understanding from you know, human cognitive neuroscience to try to solve those problems. And so that was the orientation that I, I brought to the problem in the first place. It, it, it assumes that there is a real physical world out there. Um, space and time and, and matter are fundamental and the brain is um, a very sophisticated computer, which is taking in information from the senses and computing a un an understanding of the world that is 
important for our survival. So it's recomputing those true, it's recovering those true properties of the world that our species needs to survive in the niche that we happen to exist in. So that's how I started thinking out, uh, thinking about this. And, and most of my colleagues think that way. That's pretty much the standard view. You have a then, you have a very interesting way of speaking, and I think it very much comes from the the background of what you're talking about. How when you when you wanted to look into into is a human being just a robot, just a machine? Yes, I know that that kind of led you down this journey. Yes, where where do you stand today? I do have some uh, unusual views about that. So it. it most of my colleagues would say that, um, of course, we're machines. We're carbon-based machines. Um, our brain is just a machine, and all of neural activity is is a, a machine activity. It's probabilistic, of course, but it's probabilistic machines are our machines. And so, most of my colleagues would say, of course, we're machines, uh, and we're carbon-based machines. And artificial intelligence, they would say. Um, is just another kind of machine. It might be silicon-based instead of carbon-based, but it, it's, it's not going to be a fundamental difference between humans and AIs once we get the AIs to be sophisticated enough. Once they get com complicated enough, um, then there won't be any fundamental difference unless you can think of some reason why silicon should be different from carbon, um, and, and no one would really want to argue that. So I my view... Um, it's going to take a little bit to trace, but it, I I take a, a fundamentally different view. I end up thinking, by the by the way, and we can get there maybe later on. I end up thinking that we could actually construct machines that are conscious. But but the reason that I think we can do that is utterly different from what my colleagues um, um, are, are thinking. So it's a it's a completely different route to it. Basically, we can have different types of consciousness that are different than how we are, but in some way are conscious. That, 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 that's right. And so it, it'll take a minute, but I can explain Let's how I get to, to that point of view. So, so and it will take more than just a minute. So, um, so the first step is I realized at one point that it might not be the case that evolution by natural selection would favor sensory systems that report the truth. And that was, you know, even thinking that is is a bit um, <laughs> uh, counterintuitive to most people, and, and certainly counterintuitive to most of my colleagues. But it turns out that that evolution by natural selection uh, is not just a hand wave theory. We we have something called evolutionary game theory and evolutionary graph theory, and we we can actually prove theorems now about what the effects of natural selection will be. And so, about I don't know, ten years ago. I decided that I needed to study. Um, I've I'd studied vision and sensory processing from a neuroscience point of view, and I'd studied it from a you know an artificial intelligence computational point of view. I decided I really needed now to step back and look at it very very closely from an evolutionary point of view. What do selection pressures do to our sensory systems? Will they shape us to see the truth or not? And so I started working with a couple of, of, of talented graduate students, Brian Marion and Justin Mark, who ran computer simulations where we would create hundreds of thousands of artificial worlds and put resources in those worlds. And we could then change up what are called the fitness payoffs that, that you would get for uh, obtaining these resources. And we then put creatures, you know, artificial creatures in those worlds and had them forage for resources. And some of the creatures we call, you know, truth creatures, we let them have sensory systems that could see all of the truth in the world, everything. And others, um, we had in creatures that could see none of the truth. All they could do was read off fitness payoffs. They were tuned just to the fitness payoffs. And we let them compete. And what we found was that creatures that saw the truth always went extinct when they competed against creatures of, of equal complexity that, that saw none of the truth and were just tuned to the fitness payoffs. And so that that was a bit of a jolt, but it is you know just simulations. It's not it's not a theorem. And so then I, I formulated um, a mathematical conjecture and uh, went to a, a mathematician named Chaitan Prakash. 
And he and I worked together, <clears throat> but he's the mathematician, not me. And um, we proved a theorem. Um, it's, it's a theorem of evolution by natural selection that the probability is precisely zero in the limit. As, as your sensory systems get more and more complicated, um, the, the probability goes precisely to zero that an organism um, that sees the truth will be more fit than an organism that sees none of the truth and is just tuned to fitness. I, to, to I, want, to jump, in, I want to jump in here for a sec. Right, right, right. So this sounds this sounds a lot like the difference between autism and not autism spectrum is on that on the autism spectrum. Typically, there's too many senses coming in. It's sensory overload. Is that is that more or less the moral of the story? That that's part of the moral of the story is that in in some sense we need to do things on the cheap, and so we tr the senses really have to. Um, filter things out and ignore a lot of stuff. And so in some sense, you're ignoring a lot of the truth just because it's it's too, too complicated. And that was sort of the intuition that sort of was guiding me to begin with. But it turns out that even though that's true and important, there's a, a much deeper aspect to it. And that is that selection pressures um, are only f towards um, sensory systems that are tuned to the fitness payoffs, the things that will think think of think of it as a big video game, and you're you're running around trying to grab points in the video game. If you get enough points, you get to the next level. Well, in evolutionary theory, in some sense, you know, if you eat an apple, you get certain fitness payoffs. Um, if you fall off a cliff, you know, you 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 have negative. Um, you know, fitness consequences. And so think about you're going through life and you're getting all these pay fitness payoffs. And so if you're doing anything in a in a video game except going for the points, you're not going to you're not going to get to the next level. You have to really focus on grabbing points uh, to get to the next level. And and the same thing it turns out in evolution. If you're effectively if your senses are doing anything but trying to get fitness payoffs, then you are going to be less fit. And then the weird thing is that almost surely fitness payoffs do not tell you anything about the structure of the world. So to, this, to the extent that your perceptual systems are tuning you to, you to discriminate, this is high fitness payoff, low fitness payoff, this is bad, this is good in terms of fitness, it will not be telling you anything about truth because fitness payoffs are un, they, they don't preserve the structure of the true structure of the world. And, and so we're able to, to prove that um, in two different ways, there, that, that, that idea and a different idea that, that just the optimal inference strategy that would come out of um, a natural selection also doesn't um, bias you towards seeing the truth. So, so it was, I came off thinking about it, that it, it was just going to be too expensive and too time consuming to see the truth. But then I found out, no, selection pressures are uniformly against seeing any aspect of the truth, which was quite surprising. And so we've published that result um, and had lots of feedback from, you know, my, my colleagues um, in, in cognitive neurosciences and, and philosophy. Uh, and so, so the question then that naturally comes up is, so if, if our sensory systems, if, if, if our eyes, for example, are not telling us the truth about the world, then what good are they? How, how could they possibly be useful if they're not telling us the truth? And there, I have a metaphor that I think is very, very helpful in, in this. And it's what I call the desktop metaphor. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're say using a, a paint program on your computer, like Adobe Illustrator or something like that, and you have a paintbrush icon that you're using to, to, to paint some color into a region of your, of your, of your artwork, um, does that paintbrush icon on your screen mean that inside your computer there's a paintbrush that looks just like that 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 paintbrush icon on your screen? Well, of course not. And if, if the paintbrush icon is in the middle of your screen, does that mean that there's a paintbrush in the middle of your computer? Well, of course not. And anybody who thought that misunderstands the point of the interface. The interface is not there to show you the reality of the computer, the diodes, the resistors, the voltages, and magnetic fields. It's there, in fact, to hide the truth of the computer, all that complexity, and to just give you simple eye candy, tools that let you accomplish certain tasks, that let you control the computer, even though you're completely ignorant about what's really going on inside the computer. 
And so that's what, what evolution has done for us. It, it has given us sensory systems that are like a desktop user interface. So space time, space and time as you perceive them, are your desktop. And physical objects like you know, apples and trees and forks and spoons, these things are just icons in your desktop. And evolution shaped us with space and time, perceptions of space and time and physical objects, not to show us the truth, but explicitly to hide the truth because we don't need to know the truth. Horse blinders. Just, yeah, the, exactly right. Horse blinders and and yet, this, what we do see allows us to control objective reality, whatever it might be, while we're completely ignorant about the nature of objective reality. That seems to be what, what um, if, so the way I'll put it this way, if our sense is evolved and we're shaped by natural selection, then the probability is zero that the predicates of space-time, matter, physical objects, shapes in space-time are the right predicates or the right language to describe objective reality. The probability is zero that you could even phrase a true description of objective reality using the language of space and time and matter and objects and, 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 and so forth. And so, so evolution shaped us with a language that's designed to keep us alive and that language in, just doesn't have the right tools to talk about objective reality, at least the perceptual language. It would be like this if I, if I you know, said, I want you to, uh, so I have a, a computer science class I'm teaching, say, and I, I tell the, the students, I want you to give me um, a paper that describes how the CPU of a computer works, but the only language you can use is the language of pixels on your desktop. That's the only language you can use. Well, good luck. That's the wrong language to describe a CPU. And, and that's what we're stuck with. If, we're, if we try to describe objective reality using the language of space and time and physical objects, we're, we're, we're stuck with the wrong language. We can't do it. And, and so every metaphor has its strengths and weaknesses. I'll, I'll, one strength of this metaphor is that it, 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 I think it helps us to understand how even if our senses aren't showing us the truth, they could still be helpful. You know, the, if, I'm, if I'm writing an email and the icon for the email is blue and rectangular in the middle of the screen, I'm not fooled into thinking that the email is blue and rectangular, and yet that, or in the middle of a computer. But that blue icon is very, very helpful to me. It helps me open the, the, the email. It helps me copy it or delete it if I want to and so forth. So it gives me real, uh, uh, an ability to control reality even though I don't know what reality is. So that's the, the upside of the metaphor. The downside is most of the icons and, and, and desktop interfaces that we use right now are two-dimensional. And the icons that we have are not that complicated and they don't have a lot of different functions. And, 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 but I think that downside of the metaphor will disappear in a, in a few years, very few years, when, when we have 3D holographic desktops and the icons are real three-dimensional objects that we can manipulate, and they have all sorts of new possibilities for for interaction. Then, then this this metaphor of the desktop and icons, um, with the richer kind of three-dimensional icons, will be a much better metaphor for what evolution has done for us. You could also use a picture's worth a thousand words if you walked around and there was text written everywhere. That, you, that, that's you right. Really function. So I have two. I I have a bajillion follow-up questions, but I have right. two that. I want to address quickly before sure. we before we move on. Mm -hmm. A would this be would this be the explanation then for psychedelics is more or less taking off the filter? And B is this from what I from what I understand? Let me try to summarize. From what I understand is for creatures that have too much sensory perception, they ultimately fail to creatures that have optimized sensory perception for what you call fitness functions, which is essentially survival, eating, reproducing, etc. So if that was to be the case, would that not be a very strong candidate for a Fermi paradox solution? So why haven't we found aliens? Because the optimum level for uh, a species to reach planet-wide, et cetera, would be something on a lower order. That's what, that's what evolution dynamically stabilizes for? Yeah, two great questions. So, so on the uh, you, you know, psychedelics, what psychedelics show is that with you know, just a modest dose of certain chemicals, you can get people to 
hallucinate all sorts of uh, unusual realities. And what, one thing that, that shows you is that you are able to create these various kinds of unusual realities, some things perhaps that you've never seen before. And, and so that really taps into the idea that we are the authors, we are, we are constructing the visual and other sensory worlds that, that we perceive. Now, of course, um, that doesn't necessarily completely support my point that what we're constructing doesn't show us the truth. Someone, someone who's a physicalist and is saying that our, you know, our brains are reconstructing objective reality would also say, look, um, yeah, psychedelics just show that the brain is is a constructive process. Normally, we're reconstructing the truth of the objective world, but with psychedelics, yeah, you're messing with the system. It's not behaving normally, so it's no surprise that it doesn't happen to reconstruct the truth in that case. So, so, so I wouldn't. I would say that psychedelics certainly um, comport well with my view. But someone who disagreed with me and just said, you know, no, the brain is constructing our perceptions, but the perceptions it's constructing are matched to the truth, they would also be happy with the psychedelics. I mean, they, they, they could explain psychedelics equally as well. Um, now, on, on the other one about the Fermi paradoxes, it's quite interesting. Uh, there are no selection pressures per se for intelligence. The selection pressures are only for having more kids <laughs> that's what that's what that's what fitness is all about and if you uh, you know there are very very few species that are very very highly intelligent on our on our planet you know if you look you know, there are hundreds of millions of species um and the, uh, the a couple examples will really bring this home one a funny one is is a creature called the sea squirt um as a juvenile the sea squirt has a very sophisticated nervous system and it uses its sophisticated nervous system to solve an important problem it has to swim through the ocean and find a place where there are water currents that are flowing fast enough but not too fast and that have enough nutrients in, within the water but not too rich or too poor and once it finds that ideal location it fixes itself to some rock or some object in that neighborhood and it once it fixes itself it stays there for the rest of its life and filter feeds but now the interesting thing is once it has solved this computational problem found the an ideal location and, and fixed itself it no longer needs that brain that that complicated brain that it had that that nervous system and so it eats it it eats its brain if you don't need your brain eat it and you know some people I've said that's a good model of tenure uh, in academic circles, but but anyway, it's <laughs> <laughs> but but what that 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 shows you the attitude, quoting you know in quotes. I mean, of course, evolution doesn't have an attitude, but but I'm uh, speaking in, informally here. E evolution doesn't care about intelligence per se. If you don't need brains, eat them, and we actually see this also in our own species. There's good evidence that. Um, our species has had its maximum brain capacity about 20,000 years ago. And that we've lost about 10% of our brain volume. Uh, the, the volume of a tennis ball has disappeared from our brain in just 20,000 years. So our brains uh, are, are in free fall. We're, we're, they're shrinking very, very rapidly. And one possible understanding for that might be that up until you know, 15, 20,000 years ago, we were primarily hunter-gatherers, very, very small groups, um, and you know, doing the best we could to, to, to forage and hunt and so forth. But then our brains, so our brains were big because we were trying to occupy a lot of niches. That was sort of what we had you know, been selected into. We, we, we could be flexible for a lot of different niches and, and, and go wherever the food was going and so forth. But then we got smart enough to develop agriculture. And then that led to social systems right because once you have agriculture you sort of put your roots down you can feed more people you get a bigger social network and then you can have a distribution of labor and so forth and pretty soon we we had complex social networks well social networks give you a social safety net 
I, you know, you don't know, you no longer have to be the best at everything. If you're on your own or with a small group, you have to be able to hunt, cook, you make your own clothing, take care of infections. You got to do it all yourself or you die. But in a, in a social network, um, you can have um, limited you know, pressures on you. you. Maybe I only need to know how to bake bread and someone else over there knows how to make clothes and someone else can make shoes. And, and so the, what happens in a social setting like that is you take some of the selection pressures off the individual. The individual doesn't have to be as smart. It's the, because the safety is in the, in the network. And so today, for example, uh, I can have an IQ of 70 and I can survive just fine. I can go down to the grocery store, get my groceries and so forth. And so, and that's because there's a social safety net. And I'm all, gl I'm glad for it because, you know, most of us wouldn't be here without the social safety net. <laughs> we, we wouldn't survive. But because we, each of us doesn't have to be so smart, um, our brains have shrunk. We don't need this big a brain. So we have this situation. This, it's an interesting thing where culture and biology interact. Biology brought us, we, we got smart enough that we could develop a social culture. The effect of that social culture was to relax some of the selection pressures on our biology, and so our brains began to shrink. And so here's a case where biology and social culture interact with each other in interesting ways. But it supports your point that evolution, I mean, we, we tend to think of, well, the goal of evolution is to make smarter and smarter creatures. Absolutely not. The goal of evolution is just, is, is just reproduction to the extent that you, we could talk about a goal at all. I would be interested to dive deeper into that. So I know we had a, I can't remember who it was we had on. We had um, their background was neuroscience and it was something to the effect of over the course of your lifetime. Mm. We just got kicked off. Matt, I, I can't hear you at all for about the last minute. Um, maybe I should try to reconnect. So we just had a neuroscientist on, we've actually had a couple lately, so I can't remember who it was exactly, but they were saying something to the effect of over the course of your lifetime, you lose about half the neurons in your brain. So it is in essence kind of shrinking, but the connections you have between existing neurons, they're, they're growing almost exponentially. And it's in essence, wisdom and learning. Do you think it's fitness forcing functions, having humanity have less demands, i.e. it's like we all sit in our desks today and we gain weight because we don't need to, or it's humanity up leveling and having simplicity be uh, a stronger form of complexity. Well, yeah, the, the way to think about it from an evolutionary point of view is that as the selection pressures change, then there will be changes in our brain morphology and in our bodies that, that um, that correspond to that. Um, so we used to have to go out there and hunt and gather for ourselves. And it was a very physical thing that we had to do. We had to be very smart on our feet and, and deal with, with stuff, you know, very, very quickly and so forth. Now we're, now we're in a world in which it's, uh, you know, a lot of social interaction and, and our social world is changing very, very quickly. And so there are selection pressures for us to deal with fast changing social interactions. But apparently, uh, that's those selection pressures, that they may be some selection pressures for more complexity in the brain because of the social complexities that, that have increased. But apparently, on balance, the complexity of what we have to deal with is less than when we were out there fighting for our lives, you know, against the elements. Uh, and our brains have shrunk as, as a result of that over 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 a mere 20,000 years, we've lost 10% of our brain volume. And, and when you, we've also gotten, by the way, our bodies have gotten 
uh, smaller and a bit weaker. So the, the right measure then is something called the encephalization quotient. The, the, roughly the ratio of the mass of the brain to the mass of our body compared to other, for example, other mammals. And so where, do we, where does that ratio, in our case, uh, stand with respect to other mammals? And our EQ has been dropping, the e encephalization quotient. Encephalization quotient not being the EQ most people are familiar with, uh, emotional yeah. quotient. That, that, that's right. This is the encephalization quotient and very, very different than just the raw IQ as well. That is very, very interesting. I'll need to get I'll need to get someone on whose background is in that so we can we can dive deeper into that. But just diving deeper, your work is kind of diving deeper on a on a lot of fronts. What what was it about your life that steered you in this direction, do you think? Well, so I was very interested in the question of what does it mean to be a human being? And and part of, you know, I think just most sensitive people are worried about that. It's a very personal question. What what kind of creatures are we? Why are we here? So these are sort of the the the, the deep philosophical questions that that occurred to people over over many many millennia. Um, and also I was raised in a fundamentalist Christian background. Um, where I get a, uh, I got a particular slant on things and a particular way of trying to understand what they what they thought was the truth, and so there was this conflict um, when I was growing up between the sort of dogmatic um, approach that I was hearing on on the weekends at, in church services, and the the um, the evidence based. Uh, approach to understanding that I was getting as I studied the sciences. And so that that intrigued me. Also, the different answers I was getting about what is the meaning of life and, and, you know, and the meaning of human existence um, was very, very different from the two sides. And so I decided that I really wanted to find out for myself what, uh, you know, what I thought. Uh, but I, I realized that um, the dogmatic approach as, as an approach is not a very successful approach for actually understanding things. So I needed to really take the scientific approach to try to get an evidence-based, uh, you know, precise theory-based um, approach to this whole question. So, so I decided to set out and, and try to answer questions like, are we machines? Um, are we just machines? Is there some deeper meaning to human life? Is consciousness just an epiphenomenon of, of you know, complex machine activity? Or is consciousness something something more than that or something different from that and and I you know these are of course very very difficult problems and and so I did realize that um, it, there's a real risk if you jump in too early without lots of training there's a real risk that you'll jump in and, and pretty much waste your time because you won't have the tools to even think about this stuff carefully and so that's why I, I didn't jump in on those questions directly I spent many many years studying artificial intelligence and studying human sensory systems just as technical scientific issues so I could really get a grounding in those in those technical disciplines before then I said okay now you know life is short you know, I, you know you could spend forever getting the technical background but you know you're not going to live forever so at some point you got to transition and, and go after the bigger questions that that motivated me in the first place and so so that's that's what I started to do um, it, that's, that's sort of the background about why I went this way and then I began to go after consciousness itself, right? So what is consciousness? How is it related to our brain activity? And, and we know that there are dozens, perhaps hundreds of very strong correlations between specific kinds of brain activity and specific kinds of conscious experiences. And I'll just give a couple concrete examples to, to fix the idea. There's an area of the brain called area V4, um, visual area four. And there's strong correlation between activity in that area and color experiences. And if you take a very strong magnet, it's, it's something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, and you place it uh, on the skull close to area V4, and for example, set it on an inhibit mode so that you can inhibit activity in area V4. If you do it right, then people will, uh, the, the subject will report that um, if say you did you did V4 in the left hemisphere, they will report that all of a sudden they've lost all color experience in the right visual field. So left hemisphere activity is correlated with right visual field 
experiences. And when you pull the magnet away, then the color comes seeping back into your visual world. Before you just, when, when you have the magnet on, you just see shades of gray. You, you see fine, but you see shades of gray, no color. But when you pull the magnet away, then the color comes back in. And there are dozens of examples like that that are really quite compelling that there are strong correlations between neural activity and conscious experiences. We, we talk about the various neural correlates of consciousness or the NCCs. And much of the research that's being done by um, neuroscientists um, in the study of consciousness is the very, very hard work of finding and documenting these various NCCs, the neural correlates of consciousness. Very, very important research. But it's well known that correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. And so even though we have these correlations, the, the question is, is it really true that brain activity is causing our conscious experiences or, or that brain activity somehow might be identical to our conscious experiences? And so with the work that I've been doing on evolution and perception, um, well, well, for, first, there, there was, there's a, a big problem that's, that's come up in, in the study. We have all these neural correlates of consciousness and really good research on that by this, many of my, of my colleagues and friends who, who do this. Very, very good work. But it turns out we have no precise mathematical theory, no scientific theory that could explain how brain activity causes specific conscious experiences. There's not a single scientific theory that can say this pattern of brain activity must be the taste of chocolate. It could not be the smell of garlic or the sound of a trumpet. And here's the scientific reason why. And 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 it's quite striking. So we, we have all this data and not a single theory that can predict even or, or explain even one specific conscious experience. And We're this, bankrupt. This is the hard problem. This is the so-called hard problem of consciousness. It, it, it's a hard problem because in, in some sense it's from a physicalist point of view, it's a mystery. No one really has any good idea about how brain activity could, without magic, create conscious experiences. And that's, so there are, there are you know, and I have, many of my friends are involved in this and my colleagues, um, you know, I, I'm good friends with Stuart Hameroff, who's got a, a theory about microtubules and, um, and how orchestrated collapse of quantum states and microtubules could somehow be related to conscious experiences. But when I'm with him at a conference, I, he knows I'm always going to ask, uh, okay, Stuart, can you name a specific conscious experience that you can explain with your, you know, with your theory that, that you can actually say this orchestrated collapse of microtubules must be the taste of a lemon. Can you give me even one? And he can't. And he knows at every conference that I see him, I'm going to ask the same question because until we can actually start to make specific predictions, we're not doing science yet. So, so there are no scientific theories. Um, there's another theory called integrated information theory, and and it turns out that um, Giulio Tononi is is the author of that, and and there's not a single specific conscious experience for which he can give the um, a an integrated information theoretic um, mechanism. To, that would be you know, identical to or cause uh, that conscious experience. He, he can't name one. I've, I've asked him personally, and, and there's not a single one that he can name. So we're in a position where we have um, no scientific theories and really no plausible ideas about how brain activity could cause or somehow be uh, conscious experiences. And so now that, that taps back into this work I was talking about on evolution and the predicates of our perception, the language of our perception. I mean, I was saying that uh, if our senses evolved and were shaped by natural selection, the very language of space and time and physical objects, matter, is simply the wrong language to describe objective reality. These are all just symbols. They're all icons or, or data structures. Put it that way. These are data structures that we use to as an interface with a reality that's not spatial, that's not temporal, um, that, that's not composed of physical objects. And so if that's the case, then it's no surprise that if we use the language of physical objects such as neurons, we cannot describe how consciousness arises. We're using simply the wrong language. It's just false that space exists even when it's not perceived. 
it's false that physical objects like neurons exist when they're not perceived. These are simply icons. These are data structures that we create when we need them and then we garbage collect them as soon as we don't need them. They're data structures that describe fitness payoffs and actions that we can take to obtain fitness payoffs. End of story. There are no insights into objective reality. So if we take a thoroughgoing evolutionary point of view, an apple is just a data structure it, that I create to represent certain fitness payoffs that are available to me and certain ways that I could obtain those fitness payoffs, certain actions I could take. So when I look and I see an apple, I'm creating that data structure. And when I look away, I'm garbage collecting that data structure. If I look away and I'm touching it, then I, I'm filling with my hand a data structure that I'm creating with, with my somatosensory um, sensory system. But that doesn't mean that there was really an apple there even when I'm not looking. It just means that I can make a data structure through either my visual system or my somatosensory system or my auditory system. I'm making these data structures and then I'm garbage collecting them because I have finite memory. So so the idea then, and it's, it's to my colleagues in the neurosciences, this is uh, the stunner. Neurons do not exist when they're not perceived. Therefore, neurons do not have any causal powers. Neurons cause none of our behaviors, none of our conscious experiences, um, none of our sensory experiences. And so from that point of view, it's no surprise that the hard problem of consciousness hasn't been solved and is, and is so hard. We've been assuming that somehow neurons or embodied neurons, I, mean, I have colleagues and friends who are in, into embodied cognition, and, and, and I am too, I think embodiment. Can you clarify and, embodied cognition? Yeah, the the idea of embodied cognition is the idea that um, we're not just brains and vats. You know, we we are real organisms with a real environment around us that we're having to interact with, and somehow it's that process of perception and action, and getting feedback of in our perceptual systems of the actions we're taking. There's the closed loop that's that's really important to our development of our sensory systems, and that that's sort of the embodied point of view and I, and I think that point of view is 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 quite good but we have to let go of the physicalist side of things and, and the idea is that we you know when we see an apple we're not seeing a truth a pre-existing realm and you know physical objects and we're recovering a true apple we're creating a data structure it's kind of like you are god in a sense and every person is their own God creating their own universe that all overlap? Right. Without the religious connotations, yes, we are in some sense creating what we see. In fact, I've got a book um, that called Visual Intelligence, and the subtitle is How We Create What We See. Uh, and so I, I describe um, with a bunch of rules how we how we do create our visual worlds and so yes we are creators in in that sense we are creators we're creating you create space and time you create physical objects you create the sun and the moon now i should be clear on some point because it's very easy to to misunderstand what i'm saying here there's there's another doctrine that's different from what i'm saying it's called solipsism and solipsism says the only thing that exists is me and my perceptions and I'm not a solipsist. And I'm not. I'm not. You know, trying to promote solipsism. I think that there is a reality that exists independent of whether I perceive it or not. So I think that there is a reality independent of me. It's just not spatial or temporal. It's not physical. It's not. A, it's not space and time and physical objects. It's something utterly different. When I see an apple, I am interacting with an objective reality, and that objective reality is utterly unlike an apple. It's, it's something different. Just like when I go, go back to the icon metaphor you know, on the desktop, when I see a blue icon on my desktop for an email I'm writing, I am interacting, when I use that icon, I am interacting with something real in the computer, namely my email you know, file. But that email file is not blue, it's not rectangular, it's not in the middle of anything. It's, it's, so this, the symbols that I see are utterly unlike the reality that they allow me to interact with. And, and that's the hard part for our species to really grasp, that the way we see the world 
is just that. It's just the way we see it. It's not the truth. It's our dumbed down, species specific user interface. But it's hard for our species not to make the mistake that uh, of assuming that the way we see things must be the way they really are. That the language of space and time and physical objects must be the right language to describe the truth. No, evolution shaped us with a dumbed down user interface that just was shaped to help us have kids, not to see the truth. All this stuff that we see, it, we see it that way because it helps us to have kids. It's not there to help us to see the truth. In fact, it's there to hide the truth. And so that's why the hard problem has been so hard. We've assumed that space-time exists and that neurons exist even when they're not perceived. Something exists, but it's not anything in space-time. And even physicists um, of the first rank are saying that space-time is doomed. And, then, and that's a quote, space-time is doomed. Nima Arkani Hamed um, at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton um, if you Google him, you'll see he has some very interesting talks titled Space Time is Doomed, and he explains why modern physics has to let go of space time. It's, it's not fundamental. He doesn't know what is fundamental, and, and no physicists really do know what is fundamental, but, but David Gross, uh, Nima Arkani Hamed, uh, Ed Witten are among you know, the, the very, very brilliant physicists who are saying space-time is doomed and we need to find a deeper foundation. I'm saying space-time is not the foundational concept because space-time is simply a data structure that evolution happened to program into our species as a way of representing fitness payoffs for us. It's really just, space-time is just a data compressing, error correcting code for fitness that a particular species, Homo sapiens, happens to use to keep things simple uh, and to get the fitness points that it needs. It's not an insight into objective reality. And so that's why all attempts at using physical systems like the brain and neurons or artificial intelligence systems. Now, now, now we get back to your AI question. The, uh, the whole framework of saying, could we take these you know, diodes and resistors and, and voltages and magnetic fields, if we put them together in a really complicated way, could we create consciousness? And I'm saying that whole way of conceptualizing the problem is fundamentally wrong. You're assuming that any object in space-time, like a diode or resistor, has causal powers. That's the problem. They don't. They don't even exist except when they're perceived. When we make diodes and resistors, we are somehow interacting with an objective reality that's not spatial or temporal. We, so our, our interface is real. It allows us to interact with reality. It's a good interface. It's just that the reality is utterly unlike anything inside space and time. That's the conceptual leap that we have to take here as a species to really understand our situation. What if evolution was wrong? From what I gather, the, the basis of your theory is based off of evolution's sole driving factor being the forcing function of promoting life? Very, very good. Great question. So here's what I'm really doing. I'm taking two of our most well-established and respected theories, evolution by natural selection and physicalism. And I'm saying these two theories conflict. Both cannot be true. Now, it may be that neither is true. It, uh, you know, I, so I'm not going to say that evolution by natural selection is true and physicalism is false. It could be that both are false. But, but the scientific attitude is, is this. We take our best theories, and uh, I think no good scientist really believes any scientific theories. That's, that's not the point. It's not to believe scientific theories. The point is to really study and understand the scientific theories very, very carefully and then try to pit them against each other and see if you can break them. If you can break a scientific theory, that's a time to pop, to pop out the champagne because now you're going to learn something. You finally have found a place where our best tools fail. Now it's time to see if we can get better tools. And so what I've really done, um, what I've proven is that you cannot, if, if you accept evolution by natural selection, then physicalism has a, a zero probability of being correct. Now, 
what I, my own attitude as a scientist is to then say, look, probably that means that both theories, both physicalism and evolution by natural selection, I'm not going to say that they're wrong. I think that that's too simplistic. I would say that they are limiting cases of some deeper theory. We need to come to a deeper scientific theory, for, and that deeper theory, whatever it is, it better give us back um, everything that we know and, and think is, is good about physicalism. You know, for example, general relativity and quantum theory, quantum field theory. That would be one boundary constraint on any deeper theory, that when you project it back into the space-time interface of Homo sapiens, you should get back on the one hand general relativity and quantum theory with maybe some uh, adjustments that 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 and on the other hand you should also get back evolution by natural selection um as uh, as another special case of this more general theory so so when i say that that, that i what i've done is shown that these two theories conflict and that both are, are are probably false it's not a dismissive sense of false i think these are both deeply beautiful theories I love the theory of evolution by natural selection, and I love the the, the physicalist theories. They're, they're they're beautiful, deep theories, but I don't believe them. I think that there's a deeper theory that we need to go after, and a boundary condition on that theory will be that we get back evolution by natural selection, and we get back um, the, the physicalist theories. There's one other uh, objection and and clarification I should probably give at this point, and that is some people can say, well, look, there's a lot more to evolution than just natural selection. There's random mutation, you know, genetic drift, there's linkage, there's pleiotropy, there's all sorts of other things that go on in evolution. So, you know, just by focusing on natural selection, you've, you've, maybe natural selection isn't that important. Uh, and so, so how does your, your theorem, um, you know, why should we, you know, put any, you know, credence in that theorem because it's only focusing on natural selection. And, and, and my, my response to that is, um, yes, for, for all I know, um, natural selection um, is, is for, it's certainly not the only um, aspect of evolution by, by, by no means. And for all I know, it may not be even the most powerful one. But here's the point. When my colleagues argue that we evolved sensory systems that show us the truth, the, the reason they give it for that is to say it's because more accurate perceptions, more truthful perceptions um, make you more fit. That's why we evolved to have more accurate perceptions. Accurate perceptions make you more fit. That is a natural selection argument. And no one argues and says, well, the reason that we have evolved to see the truth is because of genetic drift. The, the, no one argues for that because it, it couldn't do it. Genetic drift is a random process. It's not going to shape you towards seeing the truth. So, so what I've done in my theorem with, with my colleague Chaitan Prakash is I, uh, I've taken the only aspect of evolutionary theory that anybody has even proposed could shape our perceptions to see the truth. And I've shown that that particular one, namely natural selection, will in fact do the opposite. It will uniformly press our senses away from the truth. And so, so it doesn't matter whether or not natural selection is the primary driver in evolution, even if it's not the primary driver, to the extent that there's any selection pressures at all, they're against the truth. And so that, that's, that's how evolutionary theory comes out against um, you know, basically physicalism. So if you heard the theory, I heard a very recent uh, podcast interview looking at the importance of beauty and aesthetics when it comes to evolution, yes. specifically in animals and species where essentially if you have tons, tons of guys and tons of girls, they're in certain species, well, you have options. When you have options, you see what's happened with evolution or at least what's happened with male species. There's massively larger differentials between the men of species than there are between the women because the men have to stick out because their job is one and only thing to pass on genetic data. Mm -hmm. But it's slightly different for females if they're able to choose. I've heard I've heard that tossed around as I don't think that would replace um, evolution by natural selection. But I think I think you've got to weigh both factors in. Right. So, so the effect that you're talking about is an interesting one. And the, the key evolutionary idea there is something called parental investment. Um, parental investment theory says that whenever you have sexual reproduction, 
you can ask about um, the the minimum fitness investment that each sex needs to give to have a successful offspring to raise successfully have and raise an offspring and in some species with se sexual reproduction one one sex will have a greater parental investment than an, another in mammals the female generally has the greatest parental investment because she's bearing the child and has to nurse the child the, or the offspring um, and it's an it's an interesting consequence of evolutionary theory that the sex with the greatest parental investment will be the most choosy in picking mates because they have the most at stake um, a, a single wrong if each wrong mistake that they make you know each mistake that they make um, has a longer and bigger consequence to their reproductive fitness you know you know the, the chance to have offspring the 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 sex with the less investment the, the less parental investment um, can can more afford to be less choosy less picky um, in its choice of mates and in in our species that's the males and so so in, in homo sapiens females choose and males court but there in other species for example the, there's a seahorse in which it's the other way the um, the males have the greater parental investment in fact um, the, the the female lays the eggs but then hands the bag literally leaves the male holding the bag of eggs and he has to tend the eggs and she runs off and does whatever you know whatever the females do but he has to to raise the the offspring and it turns out that the male seahorses have the greater parental investment and it turns out the female seahorses court and the males choose so it's not the sex it's the parental investment that's the key factor here. But but this, um, Matt, is not any problem with natural selection. It's just one consequence of natural selection. So so this there's not a there's not a um, you know a, a difference here between you know, parental investment theory and natural selection. Parental investment theory is simply one of the interesting consequences of natural selection. But if I the the concept if I I have two pair of shoes and one of them's white and one of them's red i notice the red one i go for the red one mm -hmm. i think if i think if you look at species that definitely has credence because if you look at animals that may be more attractive they may not have better genetic potential it might actually be a hindrance if you see i mean peacocks evolved to show off but that certainly the larger they get the harder it is for them to actually survive in the wild it's almost a negative a negative factor with survivability with a fitness function it's an aesthetic right so this is um you might be talking about sexual selection for example where the the peacock uh, presumably um has evolved to have all those feathers because peahens um found them more attractive so there was probably you know a small variation in an early peacock that and it, it kept driving that way um, and and there is an interesting it's an interesting technical issue in, in evolutionary theory to to what extent um, sexual selection um, is or is not you know, compatible with natural selection but my own view is that sexual selection is just one special case of, of natural selection um, the 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 peacock by having all those feathers it, in, you're right that in in certain cases he's less fit he can't escape is fast from a predator he's he's burdened down by all those feathers um, on the other hand what he is saying is I am so healthy my body is so fit that I can afford all these feathers um, in, in humans um, high testosterone in, in human males high testosterone is also a sort of a peacock effect by by having a, a really big muscles and big uh, evidence of testosterone um, human males are saying um, I have a very strong immune system because it turns out that you have to have um, it, that testosterone tends to be hard on the immune system so a man who's healthy enough whose immune system is strong enough that he can be big and beefy is saying effectively um, I have a really strong immune system it's so strong that I can afford to have all this muscle and and, 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 and this Maybe. Testosterone. or I can protect you and I'm a good hunter well, it's all of those things. Absolutely. It's all of those things. But those two would kind of invalidate each other because one of them is a fitness function and one of them is not. Um, well, 
the immunocompetency is a fitness thing. So that that's very very important because it's, you, if if you if you mate with a high testosterone male, the chances are your offspring will have a better immune system than if you okay. mate with a low um, um, testosterone male. So so in I mean of course there are legitimate and interesting technical debates about sexual selection and its relationship to to natural selection, but but I don't think it's um, I myself don't think that they're at all in in competition. I think that sexual selection is just a, a very interesting special case of natural selection. I would agree as well. I, my my question was, let's say okay. let's say ninety nine percent is is mm -hmm. evolution by natural selection and one percent is sexual. Whatever it is, mm -hmm. just changing the variables in your model would change the outcomes of the model so that there wasn't purely optimizing for unintelligent uh, lack of sensory type creatures it would be optimizing for something most likely different than that probably slightly above that well yeah so the logic would would be that um to the extent so let's suppose that that sexual selection some part of it is just unrelated to natural selection um the the question would then be um for, for my theorem with with chaton um, where we show that so natural selection pressures are uniformly against the truth. And so we're saying that therefore our senses didn't evolve to see the truth. The question is, is there, so if we grant that certain sexual selection pressures are not the same thing as natural selection, is there any reason for us to believe that sexual selection pressures would shape our senses to show us the truth? And I've never seen an argument that would, that would, suggest how sexual selection independent of natural selection would ever pressure us toward the truth if anything it would pressure us just toward whatever the peahen likes whatever that might be uh you know or whatever the female likes and and that's completely unrelated to issues of of perception and reality of seeing the truth so uh, i think that the my theorem is quite secure until someone can come up with an argument about how sexual selection pressures would specifically enhance the probability of seeing the truth and i've never seen that argument does that make sense that that makes sense i i would think i would think about it i think there's i think there's got to be a cutoff point and i think i think we can see the cutoff point in modern in modern humans if we had a society of of purely uh, autism spectrum individuals the society would ultimately fall apart because my understanding and i think the understanding of science is essentially just too much sensory perception. They're perceiving too much of what's happening and aren't able to function effectively enough. With, with most things, there's a minimum effective dose. With exercise, there's a minimum effective dose. With eating, there's a minimum effective dose. Right, right. With learning, I would imagine it. I, I don't have a good theory for this, but I would imagine that would be my pushback is there's got to be a minimum effective dose. It can't be optimizing for... I mean, it can be optimizing for nothing, but I feel like that doesn't make sense, and I could be totally wrong. Right, and, and my own my own guess about you know sexual selection is that really it really is just about a, a, a version of of natural selection, and therefore the argument that I've given is is applies to that. But the interesting thing is that the 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 key thing about the theorem that that we've been working on is that. The payoff functions that govern reproductive success, we're, we've been able to prove um, for a, a wide variety of structures like total orders, a partial, you know, not, we haven't done partial orders, but total orders, um, so-called um, measurable structures and symmetry groups that the payoff functions almost surely do not preserve those structures if they're in the world. And what that means is there, the payoffs that are governing survival tell you nothing about the structure of the world. The payoffs that govern whether you're going to survive and have kids are the, the, the structure that, that, that are in the payoffs themselves is unrelated to structure in the world. If I see a total order in the structure of my payoffs, that it tells me nothing about any total orders in the objective world. And that's 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 a theorem that we've been able to prove using combinatorial theory. And and what that means is there are there's there's no in evolutionary theory, that's the only 
hook that would be available to connect our sensory systems to the structure of the world. That's the only hook that's available in, in natural selection or in evolution period. And what we've shown is that hook doesn't exist. Uh, the, the structures in our payoffs are unrelated to any structures in the world. And so, so it's, a, it's a really general feature of evolutionary theory. Um, it's, 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 it's not a peripheral thing. It's sort of in the very core of, of, of evolutionary theory itself. The payoffs don't preserve structure in the world. And as soon as that's the case, then there's just no way to get sensory systems to get tuned to the structure in the world. There's an interesting metaphor between your work and the fundamentalist upbringing. So okay. I've, heard, I've heard it said before that religion, while it it, it is what it is, we I, it's not true, but that's okay. Spoiler alert. But it has been <laughs> something that's been evolutionarily beneficial. In, in essence, a simplifying of observation, of rules, of everything to create a society that could grow to this point. That's not to say that you don't evolve beyond it, but I find it kind of interesting that the work that you're doing is also focused on why simplicity leads to better outcomes, but isn't necessarily right. That, that's, that's right. And, and you can actually use evolutionary arguments to understand the evolution of social structures and, and, and religious institutions and so forth. It really provides a framework for that. It, it even helps us to understand, evolutionary psychology helps us to understand um, the logic of our moral intuitions and, our, and of our emotions. It's, it's an exceedingly powerful theory. I'm, I'm really quite enamored of evolutionary theory. I think it's, 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 it's beautiful, it's deep, it's powerful. I, mean, I don't believe it just like I don't believe any scientific theories because I think that belief is just the wrong attitude to have toward any theory. But I deeply respect it and I've studied it and I think it's a very, very powerful theory. Um, Do you think we're potentially living in some type of multi-dimensional or multi-world system essentially where different creatures interpret things differently because they are inhabiting different planes of reality? Well, I think that we've, from, from this evolutionary point of view, I think that um, my cat has a different user interface than I have, <laughs> and an ant has different interface that e each different creature, you know, di different species would have very, very different interfaces. Bats use sonar. I, I have no idea what it's like you know, in, in the famous words of a philosopher named Nagel. What, what is it like to be a bat? I don't know. Um, they, they, their sensory world is very, very different from mine. Pit vipers use infrared. Uh, you know, I, I feel infrared is heat, but but they use it as a sensing organ. Is, a sensing organ. So, uh, you know, what what is it like to be a pit viper using infrared sensing? I don't know. It's their their interface is very very different from mine. So I think yes, um, their the the worlds. If I could get inside um, the worlds of other creatures, I don't know what that would be like. But it would probably be utterly unlike my my own space time physical object interface that I'm using. So I agree. And that physical object interface, that's what you would call consciousness, essentially your user interface to the whatever the hell is out there. Well, that's what I would call the physical world is my interface. So so there's another aspect to my theory that I haven't talked about at all, which is, um, so I'm saying that space, time, and matter aren't the fundamental reality. Well, then what is? <laughs> what, what am I going to propose to replace space, time, and matter? And, and of course, the, the first right answer is to say, I don't know. Um, but as a scientist, I'm going to propose a precise theory um, and try to be precise so that I can find out precisely why I'm wrong. So, so my attitude about my own theories is I don't believe my own theories any more than I believe any other scientific theories. I mean, again, belief is the wrong attitude. But the idea is to um, be bold and precise so that you can then um, you know, try to find out what the consequences of these hypotheses are and, and test them. And so I'm, I'm proposing... Um, that consciousness, or what I call conscious agents, is fundamental. So that the universe, instead of being a space-time fundamental thing, is really a vast so social network of interacting conscious agents, an infinite, an infinite social network of interacting conscious agents. Some of them are very, very simple. Um, a conscious agent has a, a, a set of possible perceptions, conscious experiences, a set of possible actions, which are ways that it affects the conscious experiences of other agents. And then it has the ability to make free will decisions. Given certain experiences I'm having now, I can choose to affect other people's, other agents' experiences in certain ways. 
So there's perceptions, free will decisions, and actions. And and I have a mathematical model just to be just to give people a hint of how how it can be precise. The set of perceptions is a measurable space, set of actions is a measurable space, and the uh, free will decisions are modeled by a Markovian kernel. And then the, the actions themselves are modeled by Markovian kernels and the effects of other agents on on an agent's perceptions are all modeled by Markovian kernels. So the whole thing is completely- Markovian kernel? So Markovian kernel, um, you can think of it as Suppose a simple case would be this. Suppose I only have two perceptions, red and green. I know I have only two actions, um, you know, hit or run. <laughs> okay. Just to keep it very simple. Then a Markovian kernel would, would be like this. It would say, um, if my perception is red, then here's the probability that I would hit, do hit. And here's the probability that I would do run. And then it says, but if the perception was instead of did I say green first? If it was if the perception instead was red, then I have a, the different probability for doing a hit, a different probability for doing a run. So a Markovian kernel is effect, effectively an index set of probabilities. It says for each perception, what is the probability of doing each of the possible actions that I would do? That's that's intuitively what a Markovian kernel is. Mathematically, in in the finite case, it's a, a matrix whose rows sum to one. Um, so that's the more technical thing. And in the infinite case, then then I would take a longer talk to talk about what Markovian kernels are in the infinite case. That That's a very technical thing. But in the finite case, anybody who knows matrix theory, it's just a matrix whose rows sum to one. And so it's a very, the, the mathematics is very, very precise. There's nothing ambiguous about the definition of a conscious agent. And what we can do is we can have very simple agents that have literally one bit of perception, like red versus green and one bit of action and a very simple Markovian kernel that you know that you only have a few probabilities that you need to specify. But these agents can combine. By interacting, we show that they can combine to create a two-bit agent. And those can combine to create four-bit agents all the way up to agents that have infinite um, perceptual capacities and infinite possibilities for action and infinite Markovian kernels for their free will decisions. Those you might now you might be thinking about an infinite consciousness. Uh, you might be thinking now you're getting into the realm of spirituality, and um, I, I intend to go there. I, I I'm very interested in the big questions, and but I would like to um, address them with mathematical precision. Uh, so I can propose, for example, a, a definition of God for the first time. God is an infinite conscious agent, where I've got a precise definition of conscious agent. So now I can have theorems and proofs about God. How many of them are there? I, I suspect that there's infinitely many different gods, so there's not just one. So this this theory would lead to a polytheism, so to speak. Um, are they uh, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, some of the standard? We can ask those as technical questions. Again, I'm probably wrong. My definition is probably wrong, but the point is, for the first time, I'm being precise about these issues. I'm saying here I'm offering a mathematically precise definition of the letters G-O-D. Of course I'm probably wrong, but now someone can say precisely why I'm wrong, and we can now begin the scientific process of saying, okay, oh, I was wrong there. Okay, well, how would we fix that? Okay, now let's get a new, you know, God 2.0. <laughs> And let's try that theory, and we'll see where that's wrong, and see what it predicts. And so we can we can take spiritual questions, which are among the deepest and most important questions for all of us. I mean, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? What happens when I die? These are all really important questions. Why shouldn't we use our best tools, the tools of science, to actually address these deepest questions? And so, for the first time, I think we can. Sorry. Sorry, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, someone opened the door. Oh, okay. For the did, first did, time, for the first time, we can. Uh, can oh, we? Yeah, yeah. So, so for the first time, uh, we can begin to address these spiritual questions with the rigor of the scientific method. And and why wouldn't we want to take the most important questions, the most dear issues that we have as human beings, and use the best tools that we have to try to address them? God, your family must hate this. My, my dad, um, he thought the Earth was 6,000 years old. <laughs> uh, he didn't believe in evolutionary theory. And, um, you know, 
I usually just didn't press him on it. I, t I told him I loved him and, you know, same with my mom. And and I, I knew I just couldn't go there with him. Mm -hmm. You take it out of the hand wavy and try to bring it into the, the logical and understandable. That, that, that's right, because it's too important to just um, have it be a hand wave. Um, you know, the question of, of, you know, what happens after we die? I mean, the answer is, I don't know, but I, I would like to have some precise, mathematically precise theories. So here's, here's one possible uh, attitude about that, right? So from a physicalist point of view, if you're a physicalist and you say space-time is fundamental, matter is fundamental, and matter is not conscious, and consciousness somehow arises due to complex interactions of matter, either through integrated information or microtubule collapses or whatever it might be. Then from that theory, there's a clear prediction. When you die and your brain dissolves <laughs> or, or is destroyed, um, then so is your consciousness because according to that theory, your consciousness just is a, either identical to or a function of your brain brain activity. But now let's take this other point of view, um, where space-time is just a data structure that I create. Space and time is not the pre-existing stage on which the drama of life plays out. Space-time is just my data structure. I, I'm the creator of space-time. So th what really exists is a vast, infinite social network of conscious agents. And space and time is just my interface. From that point of view, another option opens up about what happens when we die. And imagine it this way from, uh, imagine that you go with some friends to a virtual reality arcade to play say virtual beach volleyball. And you go in and you put on your helmet, your, your headset and body suits, and you find yourself immersed in a beach scene with you know, a net at the beach, sand and palm trees and so forth. And you start playing with your friends uh, or at least the avatars of your friends in, in this virtual world um, playing volleyball. And then one of your friends, say Tom, says, oh, excuse me for a minute, I need to, I'm need i thirsty, I need to get a drink. He takes off his headset and bodysuit to get a drink. His avatar collapses on the sand. In the virtual world, he's dead. He, you, you, he's unresponsive. But he's not dead himself. He just stepped out of that interface. He's, he's just fine. And so the question is, once we realize that space-time is not the fundamental stage on which the drama of life plays out. It's not the fundamental reality. It's just a user interface. It's a virtual reality that we create. Is it possible that when someone dies, all we see is the avatar that they leave behind? They've just stepped out of our interface. Now, I don't know the answer to that question, but, but my framework certainly poses that question I'm going to be looking you know, with with you know mathematical uh, analyses to see if that's a plausible interpretation of, of my framework I would definitely agree that it's plausible but I feel like it's reaching at straws I feel like that's trying to save the hope of heaven well and, and, and my attitude is I, I just don't know what the theory is going to to say here so I don't know where so so if it if it says no you know your consciousness ceases well that's so be it um, I just don't know where that that is going to go so I feel like we could probably do this for another hour, two hours. This is a this is a fascinating conversation. We're gonna have to get you back on, Don. At the same time, pleasure. at the same time, I know uh, I know there's a lot happening right now with you, what you're working on, and, and the book. That's I, did that come out yet, or is that coming soon? It's um it's coming out in August. It's going to be published by Norton in the United States. It's called The Case Against Reality, and the subtitle is Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes. And it'll be coming out in the UK um, with Penguin Press as well. It's very interesting. We're going to have to agree to disagree on this one, but sure. I will. I will agree that it's a very compelling theory, and it, it does explain. It does explain some of the challenges. I need one last thing from you, Don. Sure. If you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything. Before you tell them where to find you, what would it be and why? Um. I would say the, the real call to action is to let go of belief and be open to just understanding and exploring things that might be different than what you'd believed before. I think the notion of belief gets in the way of a lot of things. Belief causes lots of problems. It's much healthier not to believe, just to try to understand instead. 
It's much better for society. That's for sure. Yeah, that's absolutely. Don, this has been a ton of fun. It's been a it's been a mind bender. I hope everyone's enjoyed this. If they wanna if they wanna dive more into your work, where's the best place? Um, if you just Google Donald Hoffman, H O F F M A N, and my homepage is one of the first things that comes up, and I've got links to um, to my papers. There, in, in particular, there's a link that says Vita, and my Vita has all of my papers and podcasts and videos. And most have links to free online sources. So if you go to my Vita online, you can get pretty much everything I've done for free. And Don's putting out a lot of interesting stuff. Whether you agree, whether you don't, it changes your perspective, and that's important. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this, remember, you can support us so that we can keep doing this and getting awesome guests like Don, Don if you go to disruptors.fm slash Patreon. Hopefully this has been fun, and until next time, we'll see you later. Very, very good. Sweet, that was good.